I have yet to meet somebody who says, I don't want to live in the community. I want to stay here in the hospital. And I know of people to whom this was said by their doctors, you're a schizophrenic, you're going to have to accept that, you're never going to have a normal life, you're never going to have a job, you're not going to be able to really have a family, get used to it. And there are thousands and thousands of people out there to whom that story was told who have proved otherwise because of recovery. You see someone go in the hospital, some of them would even be suicidal. And they had no hopes, no dreams, no nothing. And then they come out and then you see them be able to get their own place. When you see these people grow, it's just soul to soul that you're reaching out. I want to be able to take care of myself and take care of myself well, you know, and not settle for less anymore. Like I've been used to settling and been told that I need to settle for less because I am less. Well, you know what, I'm not less. One thing about mental illness, you know, it doesn't discriminate. I feel like working with my clients, we are an extended family because we get to spend just as much time with them as we do with our own family. We got people that, that have mental illness themselves and are mentoring the client. They're showing the clients that, hey, I've been there but look at me now. The whole focus of what the Department of Behavioral Health is working on now is community-based services. And that's all predicated on this whole thing that we refer to as the recovery model. Recovery is really the recreation of community for a person. What we've learned about institutionalization is that institutionalization is in fact the isolation of a person. Well, I was first diagnosed as a schizophrenic in 1977. I had just come home from Spain. They sent him home from Barcelona, Spain. I spoke with his mission president like three different times. When he came home, he didn't recognize any of us. It's like I had to get adjusted all around with my and the world I lived in. I had to lash out at people. The first state hospital I went to was in Florida, and I stayed there around 15 years. I exhausted all the monies that I had getting him help. And finally, when Dr. Reagan told Hal, and he told me, he said, Hal, if I have to put you back in the hospital one more time, you're gonna have to go long term. So that's when he went to the state hospital. I blamed myself for years. I did. I said, what on earth did I do wrong? I mean, my child, he's the model child, and this has happened to him. And finally, I came to the realization that this was an illness that we had to accept, and we'd do, do the best we could with it. Hal was one of the first clients to come out of Central State to get discharged from Central State. And he got discharged to Central Care. First, he started off as just staying in the group home, then he went to a semi-independent group home, which led him here to a more independent residential living. Working with Harold Poe has just been great because uh, I've seen him at his worst and I see him at his, at his best. Hal has been given a second chance. He's living independent. He's paying his own bill. He's going to the doctor. He's taking his medication. He's doing everything that a person would do in a normal setting. I learned something about discipline, getting up in the morning, taking care of myself. These are things that we learn by, by working with Hal and staying close to Hal. Uh, we've kind of learned what works best for him and, and try to find that environment for him. I went up to, went through school, and I went to full step at the 10th or 11th grade. I got pregnant at an early age. <laughs> and I just got hooked up with the wrong crowd, I guess. My husband, he was really abusive. I gave my oldest daughter for adoption to my sister because I was on drugs real bad. When I was on drugs, nothing seemed like nothing didn't bother me. I used to self-medicate because I would 
bipolar and manic depressant. I accept I want to be better for my grandchildren, mainly, because I put my kids through hell. Seriously, I did. I put my kids through hell. So now I just want to make it up, tell my kids I love them. And um, with my grandkids, I want them to see me better than what I was, because I was, a, like I said, a hot mess. <laughs> I remember first picking up Barbara at her apartment her first day to the Pierce Center. And uh, I was driving the van at that point, and we started talking right away about uh, where she'd been and that what she was really, uh, really wanting to focus on was getting her life back. Remember, she kept saying that. She wanted to get her, her own life back. I met this guy at the Social Security office. His name was Charles Young, and he uh, introduced me into the Pearson. So uh, he talked to Joyce Jameson and she came to my home and she got me, brought me to this peer center. And then, you know, she helped me, you know, I went through some withdrawals and stuff like that. And she helped me through it. I always thought it was just me, 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 that I was having all the problems at home and stuff. But then when I, once I used to sit back and just listen to what other people's problem was, I said, my God. I said, now if you sit back and just listen to them people, and I listen and listen, and next thing you know, day by day, I inch my way back, you know, start back socializing with people that's recovering. I felt better because I know I wasn't by myself. She has this sense of altruism, of the importance in her own life of being there and able to help and support other people. She says, I just find that I feel better about myself when I'm able to help other people. And Barbara is really, I think, really gifted in that way. She's always looking to help other people in some way, shape, or form because it's just part of who she is. And I think that's been a very important part of her recovery. Her main pride was getting that apartment. In this way, she can pay her own way and feel her self-worth by making her own way and living her own life instead of somebody trying to live it for her. You can't help yourself when you're out there on drugs. If you see, you know, somebody that done got better and they could help this next person, help that person. Listen, you know, sit down and listen to them because you can, you can help a lot of people like that instead of judging that person, help that person. Being told what to do, uh, where to go, when to go to sleep, when to wake up, being told what's best for you, being told what you need rather than asked what you need. It's like you don't have the same freedoms that other people have. I was a daddy's girl and my dad left. My parents divorced when, when I was five. Meanwhile, my mother remarried a a guy fresh out of the Marines in his early 20s and never been around kids. And he was um, the source of a lot of the abuse. Right after my 16th birthday, uh, he kicked me out of the house. That was so traumatic. There were times that I was homeless, I slept on the streets. That just doesn't leave you. And I never had time to deal with that. There was nobody to talk to, and all I got was locked up and drugged and, and committed to a state hospital and stuck on a, a ward with, with a bunch of people that were way older than me. I was in my early 20s and told that this was my future. And a lot of it isn't just about the illness. It's about the lifestyle that goes with that illness is what's so disabling. Jamie Lynch is one of my favorite subjects. She's an excellent employee of the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network. And I remember the very day that I met her, I just went right out on a limb first thing and tried to recruit her. It was one of the best decisions that I ever made. My recovery really began about then. I was stepping into the role of a certified peer specialist. It was a great win-win for the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network for Jamie to come to work for us full-time as the director of the Peer Support and Wellness Center. And she and I have not, not walked, not run, but skipped um, toward creating now three Peer Support Wellness and Respite Centers in the state of Georgia. 
all the things that happened to me in my childhood and young adulthood are serving me now because I'm working through those experiences and they're turned around and, and they're turned into something beautiful. My name is Harvey Barksdale. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, December 23rd, 1960. At the age of seven, as I was being molested, you know, so I withdrew from society. I started being to myself, talking to myself, you know, telling myself stories. And at the age of eight, you know, I, I didn't feel no love around the house, you know, because of the still situations that was going on in my, in my life, you know. So I started running with the gang in Philadelphia. You know, I ended up in jail at the age of 12 at the YDC in Atlanta, and that's where I was diagnosed with major depression. When I got out, there was no continuance of care. And see, my mother didn't understand the fact that I had a mental illness, and she thought I was just bad. I just wanted somebody to love me. And I continued to go to jail after jail after jail, you know, and then the disease of addiction, it progressed in my life. In 87, I turned to crack cocaine. And then that life got really miserable. I always had this inner feeling that tell me I was worthless, that you know, that I was no good, that I would never amount to nothing. Before I went to prison, I was homeless, eating out of trash cans, wearing the same clothes weeks at a time. I got out of prison April the 29th of 2004. But I signed myself up May the 20th to Serenity Behavioral Health, you know, for the, they had a five-day week intensive outpatient program where I went to religiously. And in that time, I was, I was out to um, Serenity trying to get a job out there. You know, that's what I heard about the uh, certified peer specialist. I said, wow. I said, that's me. I wanted to help people like me not to go down the path of death and destruction that I took me down. I facilitate a double trouble and recovery meeting every Tuesday from 12 to 1. That's for people with mental illness and substance abuse problems. People like me. People just like me. And when I talk about recovery, I get emotional, you know, because I love this life I have today. I couldn't have dreamed of a life this good. Today I love myself and I'm comfortable in my own skin. The experience of being hospitalized because of a mental health issue is an isolating one, a stigmatizing one. It's ostracization, it's everything but community. You become the institution just like you do your illness when you're labeled with mental illness. I'm old enough to remember when you used to get a diagnosis that was basically a life sentence. And this CPS thing, this certified peer specialist training, unmasks all that. It actually shines a light on the beauty and truth of being a survivor and supporting people in their own survival. First, I go to the hospital and build my rapport with them in the hospital. And then when they get out of the hospital, I follow them in the community, whether they go to the personal care homes or their own place. And then what I do is whatever they want to do in their life, I assist them in doing this. I and myself am a peer, so I've walked a mile in their shoes. The main goal at the end is to be able to help others to gain what we have. We're trained in uh... CPS certified peer specialists to uh, effectively talk to people with mental illness and, and to listen intently. And that's the big thing, to listen, to get them to open up and talk and to, about their mental illness and about their life. First thing I do is share my story with them. And that uh, automatically lets them know that I understand where they're coming from. And that normally opens them up to start talking to me about their ambitions and their goals in life, you know, and what it would be like if and when they get out of there. 
We know that, for instance, that the cost of a bed day in one of the state hospitals is, is in excess of, of $387 per day. And it is much more cost effective to uh, have a person living uh, in their own apartment, uh, going to uh, supportive programs out in the community. In the recovery model, we talk about finding those natural supports that exist out in the community. Some of the obvious ones would be church. Those don't cost the, pet, the taxpayer. And these are the things that people really want to have in their lives. Working a job, having a house, going grocery shopping, having friends. The work that the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network does is a very doubly beneficial thing because we get to support peers, but we support peers with peers. And so the people we employ are also the people that we once served. It's a big bang for the buck. The medical model uh, is, is focused on what's wrong, on what's, what, what is sickness, what, is, what are symptoms. We're, in the community, we're focusing on how I can have positive relationship with people, how I can have a job, how I can live in an apartment of my own. A lot of places lack housing in the communities. If we don't have those homeless shelters available so that they can move on into their own apartments, it's very difficult for them to ever recover. In the end, recovery is the choice not of a doctor, not of a social worker, not of a nurse, and not of a family member. Recovery is the choice that a person makes for themselves and by themselves and because of themselves. And that's the only way it works, is when the person themselves chooses recovery out in the community. They're citizens of America and they should be treated like citizens of America, you know. And that's how, as, as a person, Speaking about mental illness, that's all I wanted. It just give me a chance, you know. And I was afforded the chance. I forgive them for what they've done to me, because if I don't forgive them, I will continue to kill myself. So why not forgive them and move forward? I live by what they taught me in recovery. They loved me at the Georgia Mental Health Consumers Network until I learned to love myself. That's recovery. Each one of these pairs that I'm partnered with, I love them. I love each and every one of them. And I don't want to see them back in the hospital. I don't want to see them hurt. That's why I work with them so closely and so adamantly. I know they can do it, because I did.